uh, this year's obligatory security talk. So, uh, hello everyone. Um, so I do, uh, I do various open source uh, wireless software and hardware projects, uh, mostly software lately. Uh, I did the, uh, the Kismet wireless sniffer, if anyone's played with that. Um, thank you. Uh, new version, lots of new stuff in Git, check it out. Uh, previously I did work for uh, Aruba Networks doing enterprise Wi-Fi uh, systems, and uh, I worked for Blackphone designing secure Android phones. Uh, so this will hopefully be a fun presentation. Um, so we've done this before. If you've been to SharkBest before, you've probably heard me, you know, do my little dance and rant about security up here. Uh, we're here again. Um, you know, clearly we've learned all our lessons from last year. We've solved this. We know what we're doing. It's great. Uh, you know, did we learn any lessons from last year? Uh, the rule is if there's a question in the headline, the answer is always no. Uh, so, you know, we're going to keep, keep beating the dead horse. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of a good view of, of I think, where we, are, where we stand in, in security today. Um, you know, I think most people, most companies' incident rep response plans, we've got a good grip on it, we can sum it up easily. Uh, and, you know, when that inevitably doesn't work, <laughs> hide. Uh, so, I mean, uh, security really matters for everyone. Uh, it used to be sort of, you know, this is the... Uh, some of the network security nerds and the server nerds would, would really care about the security stuff, and, and no one else would really you know, be too, too affected by it. But uh, your attack surface now isn't anything like it was a decade ago or even five years ago. Uh, the people that are attacking you now are nothing like they were you know, a decade ago. Uh, you might not even have your data where you think it is, thanks to cloud storage, uh, you know, international storage agreements, different companies holding data internationally. Uh, and the vulnerable areas and the people in your organization who are at most risk may not be who you even expect they are. Uh, so the old attackers would deface web pages. You know, so often they'd DDoS a service, they'd knock down, you know, Xbox or uh, PlayStation Network or something. Maybe a little light credit card theft, a little, little, little felony here and there. But, you know, they're mostly out there to cause mischief. Uh, you know, remember these guys? Remember when these guys were the biggest threat on the Internet that, you know, Anonymous would target your company and knock you offline or deface your web page? Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't such a bad threat, all things considered. I mean, up, up until, you know, the late 2000s, uh, exploits and bugs were pretty much always freely published. You know, people kept on some interesting ones in private, but they would, you know, in general, post them on security lists or put them in various tools and whatnot because they weren't seen to hold real monetary value. Um, update cycles were slow. Before Microsoft had Patch Tuesday, when did you apply a Windows update? When someone finally or in your organization said, oh, Service Pack 4 is out. You needed to go download that this year. Uh, you know, and, and for a long time, security problems were seen as normal bugs. Oh, you can crash that. Well, I don't care. Don't do that. No one would do that in the wild to it, obviously. Um, and you know, there was a whole group of you know, low-talent people, or I, that's a rude thing to say, but people who did not develop the exploits themselves, often teenagers, so I guess low-talent could apply, uh, would, would hack systems using, bugs, using bugs that were publicly published. So they didn't have to know how the exploit worked. They would you know, just go download the script to do it and go have fun with someone's web page. Um, so you know, most of the attacks were going in there to deface the website. So you get your website replaced, you know, big red thing, you know, some flag or something probably. Uh, the anonymous group there, they routinely pick someone in the news to target, give them a real hard time, take down websites and whatnot. You know, DDoS was out there. Um, you know, I think it was, what was it, Gerald, the first Shark Fest? that uh, the website got DDoSed? Uh, second or third. So, you know, still about, you know, eight, nine years ago, DDoS was an unusual thing. It was exciting that it happened. Everybody was like, oh, get us back at captures, as Gerald says in the keynote, you know, let's see what's going on. Now it's like, oh, great, another DDoS. It's just everywhere now. Uh, and there are toolkits, like uh, there was one called Low Orbit, Low, bleh, Low Orbit Ion Cannon, which just packed a whole bunch of exploits for taking down websites and doing uh, scripting vulnerabilities. And... Anonymous gave it to all the people who joined their group and just said, you know, go run this against things and you'll get in and you can replace the website. Uh, there are beginnings of hints of uh, strange things, you know, larger botnets. Um, Code Red and SQL Slammer in the mid-2000s came out. They were super fast spreading worms. They hit a lot of the networks and things started going down and everybody went, well, that's an interesting development. And then people kind of forgot about it a bit, but it was the beginning of, of things getting more dangerous out there. 
Um, no, obviously, if you worked in banking or at a Fortune 500 or you were a defense contractor or something, you faced very different threats. But they weren't publicly known and they didn't affect everybody. Uh, so what's going on now is, uh, you know, some elements of the old groups are still around, but it almost makes news when someone just defaces a website when they own it instead of doing something terrible. Uh, so, you know, when was the last time you, you went somewhere and just saw, oh, you know, this website has been owned by and a nice black page and red text or something. Uh, it's because there's a lot more money out there now. You know, everything on the Internet is a business now, and there's new attackers out there now doing things. Um, exploits have real, real monetary value now. Um, you can, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how good an exploit it is. So, you know, browser, Java, Flash, etc. There are hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you can go from a web browser to kernel execution, you, you've made half a million dollars. Uh, no one is going to burn those just to take out a website and put up their message of the week yelling at people and cursing. Uh, but it's not like development has stopped on exploits, so what's going on with them? Um, so what's, you know, things that have been happening lately. Um, there's a major incentive to compromise payment processing systems. Uh, so we saw this, you know, Target, Home Depot, uh, other national chains, um, Heartland uh, Credit Card Processing Center handled the credit cards for, you know, thousands of different companies processed all the payments in one location. They got up. Uh, we're seeing attacks both against the front-end cash registers where it infects the cash register machine and scrapes the RAM so that as it reads the credit card number, it copies it out of RAM and logs it. Uh, or we've seen it compromise the network where it, comp it gets all the credit card data in, or data in transit. We've seen it compromise the back-end processing systems where you know, they aggregate everything and apply the billing and now it's just stealing it out of their databases there. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of money in that. Um, so, identity compromise. Uh, don't raise your hands for these, please. Have you ever applied or held US clearance? Don't raise your hand. Have you ever used Ashley Madison? If you don't know what Ashley Madison is, it's a website going, I want to cheat on my wife or husband. Let's go hook up on this website. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Have you ever had a credit card rating? You can raise your hand for that one. I've had credit rating. Everyone's had a credit rating. Uh, you've already had all your info stolen. If you know what the SF-86 form is, it is the US application for government secret clearance. It is your full history, everywhere you've lived, everyone you've known, uh, social security numbers, social security numbers of everyone in your family. You can go Google this, you know, even if you're not applying for clearance, you can just go Google SF-86 if you want to be really terrified. All of that got stolen. Everyone who has ever held clearance or applied for clearance in the U.S. had their data stolen. Complete SF-86 forms from the uh, operations management company that ran it. Similarly, F Ashley Madison lost all of their accounts. So, what's the value in stealing an identity? Well, you can open new credit cards, you can take out mortgages, you can take a card, max it, and go get another one with a different name. Uh, the U.S., for anyone who is not a U.S. citizen, uses permanent ID number, a social security number. You can't change it. When that gets stolen, someone can use that to open accounts in your identity indefinitely. That means this stuff can get stolen and just lay dormant for 10 years. Sure, you get free credit card monitoring when uh, Equifax gets owned for a year. That data is still perfectly good to get you uh, to, to uh, open bank accounts in your name five years later. Uh, unfortunately, there's also a more sinister option to this. So that was an interesting three examples. Um, government clearance, people who cheat on their spouses, and people who might have credit problems. So now we've got hundreds of thousands of people who've got cleared access to secure information who might have used the same email to sign up to cheat on their spouse and have financial troubles. That's an interesting intersection of data if you put it all together, isn't it? Uh, you know, <laughs> let, that, uh, let that percolate a moment. Uh, so, you know, what would be the benefit of a hack like that, the co that combined all three of that, 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 those pieces of data? You know, get, get your tinfoil hats ready. Every year I joke I need to bring a roll of aluminum foil and just have everybody make hats during the talk, but I always forget to. Um, intelligence agencies are collecting information on targets being, via hacking. Um, nation state espionage is a thing. It is going on. There is strong evidence that it was a you know, foreign nation state that hacked OPM to extract the US clearance data, which would mean Whoever that was now knows when you travel overseas, do you have clearance, what your clearance is, 
And, uh, I don't know, maybe if you wanted to cheat on your spouse or needed money and had a convenient way to contact you now that you're in their country. Um, it isn't just at the national security level. I mean, if you were trying to, you know, extort information out of or steal designs out of a company and you could search the, the Ashley Madison dump and find out that one of their employees is cheating, you could blackmail them to steal data out of the company for you or even just get you a login or just open the back door and let you come in for a half hour. Uh, you know, any amount of damage can be done because now that people are mingling their work lives and their personal lives so much uh, with their online presences, it's easy to find people who are, you know, weak to these kind of attacks because they've, you know, decided to cheat on their spouse. Um, so, you know, it, it gets weirder. Um, it is, it, it's kind of funny to talk about nations hacking each other and whatnot, and all of a sudden have it not be a movie plot that, oh crap, this stuff is kind of real now. Um, the, the level of nation state hacking is definitely increasing. Um, so, you know, uh, nations under strict embargoes like North Korea and Iran don't have a lot to lose by hacking people. What are you going to do? Arrest them? We've got arrest warrants out for, pe for uh, people and groups in, in Russia, uh, intelligence operatives in Russia that the, the U.S. government has, claimed, uh, has established that uh, are responsible for hacking things like the DNC. And what does this mean? Well, it means they probably can't travel to any country that has an extradition agreement with the U.S. Other than that, it doesn't really impact them. And, you know, a lot of people in some of these countries aren't traveling a lot of places anyway. Um, Attribution is really, really hard. I mean, did you get hacked by Russia? Or did you get hacked by China pretending to be Russia? Or did you get hacked by some random guy in Russia? Or is it Iran pretending to be China, pretending to be Russia? Uh, we don't have any standard. No, it's a pretty good. We, nation, nations have a pretty good understanding of, you know, you lob a rocket over the border at us. We're going to send tanks at you. It's going to be an exciting, energetic response. Where is that threshold for you hacked us? Nobody knows. Which means there's a whole lot of wiggle room for anything that doesn't elicit a kinetic response. Uh, and how do, you, how do you do it to someone where you already said, you know, well, you already are under sanctions, you can't sell in the U.S., etc. Well, they don't care. They're going to still keep hacking us. Um, and highly advanced nation state attacks now are the script kitty attacks next week. So, for example, um, does eternal blue mean anything to anyone? So this could, yeah, came out a couple of years ago. So there is a group called the Shadow Brokers, who in very strange broken English held a Bitcoin auction for, we stole these toolkits from the NSA, buy them from us. And nobody did. So they went, all right, here you go, and just posted them all. And one of them included this thing co called eternal blue. Um, possibly it came from the NSA, possibly it didn't. Who knows? Uh, this was quickly turned in, so this was a Windows file share exploit that worked from uh, Windows XP through Windows 10. Uh, so very quickly, it got turned into WannaCry, which almost certainly everyone has heard of, which was a nice, nice piece of ransomware that hit you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of systems. Since then, it was also further adapted, maybe by Russia and North Korea. Who knows? Attribution's hard. Um, into uh, malware called Petya, there's not Petya, and there's hundreds of other malware, malware frameworks that are now using this as well. So a secret exploit held by a government agency used in very rare cases got leaked, and now it is in you know, thousands of malware toolkits already. Um, there's been you know, a well-documented rise in hacks attributed to Iran since the US withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal. Um, it's a combination of, you know, nationalistic political retaliation and a declaration of, hey, you mess with us, maybe you don't have clean water for a week. Uh, so a lot of these hacks are targeting industrial control systems, uh, electrical grids, municipal systems, um, you know, water treatment plants. Anything that's online that's of use to prove a point is getting owned. Um, North Korea has had many publicly attributed uh, hacks. Uh, often for political statements. Um, who remembers when Sony got hacked about five years ago? Um, so it was in part uh, to delay the release of the interview, which was not very nice to North Korea's leader. 
Um, the other thing that has been uh, attributed to North Korea is uh, using hacking to raise money. You know, it's very hard for them to get international currency. Uh, but Bitcoin mining, hacking Bitcoin exchanges and stealing millions of dollars in Bitcoin, uh, ransomware with Bitcoin and whatnot have all been attributed um, to North Korean actors as a way to bypass the currency sanctions. Uh, and of course, espionage, info gathering, and poisoning the supply chain. Um, another good example, uh, Kaspersky antivirus. I certainly remember them, hopefully others do. Um, very well-known antivirus company, been around since the 90s. Uh, recently been bailed, banned from all U.S. government sales because uh, the U.S. government feels they have compelling evidence that, the, uh, that Kaspersky is being used by the Russian Intelligence Bureau to mine top secret documents through the antivirus sensor. So they're installed on millions of systems and they just need to look for, you know, keywords like top secret and then exfiltrate the documents. It's, uh, you know, who can say if, they're, if it's, you know, they're complicit in it or if they're unwilling participants or if they even knew they were being used by the intelligence bureau. Attribution is hard. Who hacked who to do what to you? No idea. Uh, however, Something they did do recently was they released a major press release on a thing called Slingshot. So Slingshot is router malware. It's designed to infect microchip routers and, a, and several other brands. Uh, you know, small Soho routers, small businesses, home, home routers, generally found in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, so this was pretty advanced malware. Uh, Slingshot did kernel mode infection. It would hide from user space. It could do dynamic malware insertion on streams going through it. So if you connected to an access point running Slingshot, it could trojan your connections and then infect the client machines. Uh, it could monitor for keywords and whatnot. And everybody went, that's an interesting thing Kaspersky just released publicly. So the problem was Slingshot was an active JSOC SOCOM operation against ISIS, currently in operation against very bad people. It's not in operation anymore. Um, so where did these samples come from? Mm. Everyone has contacts in the Middle East if you're a nation. Um, it, a lot of people are viewing this as possible retaliation against the U.S. for banning Kaspersky. Like I said, it's getting weird. Things out there are weird. So, uh, the question was, is the malware pre-installed? No, I believe it was an active attack that would compromise targeted systems. However, again, all we know is what Kaspersky released because SOCOM isn't in the habit of releasing operational information. So, you know, but, you know, where's the line here? Uh, you know, when nations are willing to sling ex exploits and publicly spoil intelligence operations, you know, there's reasonable evidence that Russian intelligence gave Kaspersky the malware to analyze and release. Did they tell him what it was? Who knows? Did they actually do it? Who knows? Attribution is hard, but someone did. You know, what's the line before kinetic response? And then where does that leave all of us? Because, you know, I'm sure some people here work for defense contractors and government and whatnot. However, all the rest of us, you know, we have networks at home. We, you know, work for small businesses or even large businesses. Now, suddenly, you know, we're targets of nation state level attackers. It is, you know, North Korea is out there compromising swift payment systems, banking stuff, uh, industrial control and whatnot. So, we are suddenly all in the role of having to deal with intelligence bureau level movie attacks on our own stuff. So, you know, where does it leave us? It's, it's drinking time. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the thing about cyber attack stuff is that it levels the player playing field. It, it resembles terrorism a lot. You need, you know, a couple people who are motivated with, with simple tools to inflict great damage. And in fact, the more technologically advanced their adversary is, the more damage you can inflict. You know, if, if you're fighting a country that mostly uses well water, then compromising their municipal water system isn't going to hurt them. On the other hand, if you're against a country that has a highly mechanized, technologically monitored water control system, being able to shut that down has a huge impact. Um, and it still it muddies the attribution waters. We don't know. You, you can't prove who's doing it, so how do you have an official response? Because all it takes is, you know, a government to say, oh, it's the, it's, you know, it couldn't have been another nation hacking us. It was a 400-pound teenager with too much time in his bedroom. Or 
it was absolutely Russia who did it. Well, it came from a Russian IP. Did it come from the Russian government? Did it come from a Russian citizen? Did it come from, you know, a server in Russia hacked by China? You don't know. So now, now you've both got a, an unequal threat plat, uh, level, and you've got the inability to know who to respond to and how to respond to them. So, you know, cyber! Um, so, you know, for us, you know, what threats will I actually see? So I included this quote from James Mickens, and I highly recommend you go Google James Mickens. He is my hero for security stuff. So, you know, in the real world, threat models are much simpler. You're either dealing with Mossad or not Mossad. If your adversary is not Mossad, you'll be fine if you, don't pick, if you pick a good password and don't respond to, pain, to emails from cheapest pain pills at virusbasket.russia. If your adversary is the Mossad, you're going to die. There's nothing you can do about it. The Mossad is not intimidated by the fact that you use SSL. <laughs> so James Mickens was uh, a head security researcher at Microsoft. Uh, so, you know, will you see O'Day now? Probably not. You can never be definitive, but probably not. In the good old days, you know, exploits would hit the mailing lists. Everybody would have it in their hands the first day, and you had no chance to patch because nobody knew about it. But now that there's real money in that, you know, they're going to hold on to it. They're going to sell it for money. They're going to sell it to groups that also want to hold on to it for specific uses. If you're not that specific use, you're not going to see it out there until it leaks, it gets used, and then suddenly everybody has it. Um, so, you know, chances are you're not going to hit by an unknown attack. I'm going to throw a disclaimer in there. If you're a government contractor, if you work in defense, if you're a bank or a Fortune 50, your risk profile is not this. You need to worry about these things because they are going to buy them and use them against you because it's worth it. Unfortunately, once the exploit goes public, um, software doesn't care how much money and effort it took to write and that someone just bought it for a million dollars. As soon as someone uses it on the internet and someone gets a copy of it happening, it's going to get commoditized. It's going to show up in Metasploit, it's going to show up in malware, um, it is going to be out there and you're going to have to deal with it. Um, known patched vulnerabilities are getting reused. When WannaCry came out, Windows had fixed the bug three months previously. It was solved. If you were up to date, you would not get hit by Eternal Blue and WannaCry. Hundreds of thousands of people did. So, I got a little ahead of myself. But yeah, so WannaCry infected over 400,000 systems, according to the, the reports I found, derived from Eternal Blue months before. Um, if people had been applying Patch Tuesday updates, this never would have happened. Why didn't they apply the updates? Uh, they were on internal networks where they didn't have updates. They were in companies where they couldn't apply the updates because they had to qualify it against their deployed software, or they were running illegitimate copies of Windows that couldn't get the updates. Um, so Petya was another variant of Eternal Blue. Came out about six months, seven months after WannaCry, which came out two to three months after it was patchable. 17,000 systems still got hit by it, mostly in Ukraine. Now, this happened during the, the escalation between Russia and Ukraine, and there's some evidence that it was a very politically driven attack based on the systems it was going after. Now again, not Petya. This came out after Petya. So now we're looking at nine to 12 months after this bug was completely fixed. Uh, significantly modified version of this attack, much more aggressive, and it used additional exploits. It was spread via email, it was spread like normal malware, it would spread via phishing attacks and whatnot. It looked like Petya. It looked like ransomware. It wasn't ransomware. It just nuked every file on your system and put up a message that said, give us money and we'll fix your files. But they couldn't because the files were already gone. This again happened in Eastern Europe. It hit Maersk Shipping, which is a major international shipping company, and other large Ukraine businesses. Now again, it's hitting businesses. So if this is a politically motivated attack from an intelligence bureau during a border dispute, they're targeting shipping companies, industrial businesses, manufacturing. They're, it, it's going against people in the economy, not other government groups. So we're all targets. Um, you know, Office, Flash, Java, all, these have all been hit with high-profile vulnerabilities. They've all had the vulnerabilities patched. 
Most of them have had patches before the malware that really took advantage of these spread. Millions of systems are still getting hit by it. Update. Apply the updates. <laughs> um, so, you know, the other things people are getting in with, you know, system library. So Equifax got up. Um, again, if you had credit rating in the U.S., you probably were affected by this. Uh, the point of entry was a bug in Apache struts. So somewhere deep in one of their web apps, they used Apache struts, forgot they used it. They, maybe they didn't even write it. They probably had some contractor write the app and deliver it to them. Uh, so the bug went public. Uh, this, was in one of the, this was a slightly unusual case. Equifax got owned within six days of the bug going public. That's really quick. We can give them some credit because, you know, it's difficult to update an enterprise level thing in six days or less. Where they fell down was that they had no detection and didn't know they were owned for months while all the data got taken out of their system. But again, publicly known vulnerability. Once it went public, somebody went, oh, well, nothing to lose, and burned it again against Equifax. So why are things worse after the patch is publicly known? Because the attack now has a limited lifetime. People are going to get updates eventually. You know, obviously not as quickly as they should, but they'll eventually get the updates and this bug will be worthless. So it's publicly known there's no reason not to burn the exploit now because it's going to go away. You've lost your monetary investment in sitting on it. So if you're going to use it to own people, use it now. Um, also, once the patches are public, even on closed source software, you can reverse engineer the patch and find out how the exploit works and then create your own exploit based on it. So, there's a whole industry of as soon as Microsoft patches land, people are reverse engineering them to figure out how to write an exploit before people patch. Uh, so what needs to get patched? Uh, everything. I mean, pick a thing. If it runs software, it's going to need a patch. But what's really everything? Do you even know what in your, in your business needs to get patched? What's your attack surface? So, you know, where, where, where do people look to attack? You know, the, so the attack surface is, you know, you're publicly facing vulnerable areas. Uh, so public facing resources, uh, parts of your network that are poorly secured or can't be secured, uh, parts of your uh, device pool that are poorly updated or can't be updated, uh, IoT, Android, that kind of thing, uh, and some high profile employees and even surprisingly not high profile employees are being targeted because they work in finance or in SEC notification or things like that where there is real money in compromising them. You know, the most secure device is the one you can't talk to. It's the server embedded in concrete at the bottom of a lake. That will never get hacked. That's not super useful, though. Uh, I mean, we all generate and consume information, and all our companies buy and sell information. Everything's connected now. Everything's attackable. Everyone is online in some form or another. Um, even if you're not on Facebook and LinkedIn, you have some sort of online presence. You're findable um, in one way or another. And uh, everyone is bringing their own devices to work. Or at least in many industries, people are bringing their own devices to work now. Because until you know, the late 2000s again, you know, hopefully everyone's pretty familiar with this model. Corporate supplied you your laptop. You go in, you pick up your laptop. It's corporate provisioned. You don't have admin on it. They run everything for you. They manage the software. They manage the certificates. They manage the antivirus. They manage the Wi-Fi. It's pre-configured. You know, it auto logs in, and you type in your Windows domain password, and you're on the network. And that was all OK. It was pretty easy to do if you managed the whole the whole chain top to bottom. But now everyone is bringing their own little phones to work. And oh, I want corporate email on my phone, and I need Slack on my phone, and I need Office 365 to be able to read my email stuff. And even if you don't let them bring their own devices, they're going to take the corporate laptop and go to Starbucks and sit down and connect to unencrypted Wi-Fi. And it looked like Starbucks, kind of, I hope. Yeah, they'll just throw logins at that until it works. Now all of a sudden, your threat perimeter instead of being your corporate office and your corporate network includes, you know, iOS, whatever random crap they installed on their phone, Android, whatever randomness they configured for their home Wi-Fi, etc. So, you know, all of a sudden users are back in control. Uh, so the problems with people bringing their own devices to work is you usually can't enforce the software they run. Sometimes you can. Sometimes there's options for it, or you can use, you know, Samsung, Samsung Knox to restrict that they can only use email in certain conditions and that kind of thing. 
Uh, you can't control what else the user does with that system. You know, maybe they like to download random Flash games from the internet and play them. And you know, sometimes they don't work, and sometimes Windows complains at them. But you just click OK until you can play Elf Bowling, and you're fine. Um, you might not be able to say you have to update. You know, maybe someone's got a pirated version of Windows that isn't getting patches because they don't care. They got it off, you know, their kid's college machine or something. Um, updates might not even exist. And, you know, I'm going to pick on Android here because I worked in the Android industry and. Android is terrible at updating. Um, I believe at last count it was 0.05% of Android phones have the latest Android OS on them because it counts on the manufacturers creating updates and every manufacturer has to create a custom update for every model if they care to. They don't care to. They want you to buy a new one. So I don't know the origin of this. But I believe it must be a government contract that said updates must be available on floppy. <laughs> I don't know if you can read it on the projector, but that is disk three of 3,711. <laughs> um, you know, if, if, you, if you lose administrator access, you know, if someone owns the administrator account on your system, that's really bad, but with someone's personal machine or even their corporate laptop and their user account, that user owns all the files. That user on the corporate laptop owns all the email, all the documents, all the specs, and, and, and everything that they've downloaded is owned by that user, not administrator. You don't even need to break administrator on Windows to get almost everything that that user cares about or that you care about that user having. Uh, and users are really, really porous, great ways to get into the network. Um, and, you know, in the corporate network is where all the really juicy stuff is. Unless, of course, it's already all on Google Drive and Dropbox, in which case you just have to get the user's account on them and you're done. But, I mean, no one would use their same password on their, or their same email and password for, for work and Ashley Madison and Dropbox, right? Uh, and, you know, if you get into the network, there's lots of juicy, defended, uh, poorly defended stuff inside the network. Uh, so you can get access to users all sorts of ways. Um, you know, you can do you know, generic phishing. We've talked about phishing for 15 years. Still works. Still works. Works great. People do it all the time. Social engineering with Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, I've got coworkers who make bait accounts on LinkedIn and just see who tries to friend them from, you know, where. Like what countries, what companies, what weird accounts suddenly want to get info from them. Uh, reused credentials, like we said. Um, devices outside your ne network perimeter are still great targets. Uh, so, you know, if you, can, if you can hack a user's phone when they're at home and wait for them to take it into work the next day, then you're inside the corporate network. So, you know, what, o what other things do users have? They have SSH keys to log into production systems. Uh, uh, the kernel code had uh, some compromises recently, and I believe Debian did as well, which were traced back to, you know, one guy got owned and he had the SSH and Git keys to log in. And you know, it got tracked pretty quickly, but still, it gave them access in. And if you're not doing large-scale monitoring of this sort of thing, you have no idea if someone is using an employee's credentials to get into your Git repository and then copy all your code out. Um, they could commit code in. If you don't monitor where commits come from that well, then you could Trojan a company's product by committing into it from a compromised user. Uh, they have confidential documents. If they work in payroll, then they could have other personal information, healthcare information, uh, payment info, bank accounts for direct deposit. All this stuff is most likely under that user's account on their machine. They don't even have to get root or admin. It's just, you know, whatever user's clicking and running crap on the web owns these documents as well. So now they're in. What's going to happen? Um, well, it depends who got in. Uh, ransomware is very prevalent and it is growing. Um, it's crippled hospitals, it's crippled shipping companies. It shut down the Atlanta city government for about a week and a half. Uh, to the point of if you needed to update your license, you might not have been able to and you had to fill out all the paperwork by hand and wait for them to go search the filing cabinets. If you handle banking or other finance and your systems just got ransomware, you have a big problem. If you're a hospital and you can no longer book patients or look up what their medicine schedule is, you have a life-threatening problem. If you're lucky when they break in, all they're going to do is install Bitcoin miners and sap your power bill for a while. But what else is on the inside of your network that they can mess with? 
So industrial control systems were, you know, IoT before IoT was cool, I guess, for monitoring your eggs in your fridge. Um, so, you know, industrial systems, will, you know, they can control lights, heating, uh, factory machines, safety systems, uh, liquid and fluid and gas control valves, power generation. If you're in the manufacturing business, you care about industrial control systems. If you're in the chemicals business, you care. Uh, industrial systems are a big, big target of state actors. So, because in 2010, we had Stuxnet. No one's ever said they wrote Stuxnet. The general consensus is that it was likely US and Israel. So it spread via infected USB drives and internal networks throughout you know, the Middle East. Uh, ultimately, the payload turned out to be, it introduced a wobble into a centrifuge used by Iran for uh, nuclear materials enrichment. So this whole widespread malware was targeting a specific, I believe it was made by Ericsson centrifuge with detailed knowledge about how to introduce a wobble to it. So this was possibly the first, or at least the first publicly known, you know, cyber weapon, as much as that term is painful. Uh, so, and the goal was, you know, very political. It was disabling what was considered to be a weapons program without provoking a kinetic response. It also, went, it also made everybody go, well, you can do that and not get blown up. Maybe we can do other things and not cause missiles to fly. So, then things started happening. Uh, 2012, Saudi Aramco got hit with a virus called Shamoon. Uh, this was attributed to Iran, uh, and its goal was nuking hard drives. So it got into the corporate network and wiped uh, about 12,000 desktops and servers. Just not, not, not crypto, not ransomware, just wiped the data. Um, there were messages in it, it, contained in it that claimed it was retaliation for Stuxnet and another, uh, another government malware called Flame. Um, for Saudi Aramco, the oil production network was separate from the office network, so it did not impact their oil processing facilities. However, this year, late last year, early this year, Hasni Petrochemical and related petro refineries in the Middle East um, got hit by a thing that looked a lot like Shamut. It started wiping uh, hard drives and leaving political messages on it. They discovered there was an actually a second payload in it so that while everyone was dealing with restoring all the desktop systems, it was targeting the TriConnex industrial valve control devices with the goal of causing the oil refineries to explode. Um, the attacks had already gone in and mapped the internal control networks of the industrial systems. It wasn't just blindly triggering things. Someone had already had insider knowledge of the refineries. Um, the goal was to blow up the plant. Um, it reported back specific targets, like specific valves that they could use to control things that would cause problems and not just randomly switch valves on and off. Uh, there was a bug that caused it to crash the controllers instead of causing them to malfunction. So they shut down instead of either closing or opening, whichever one was going to cause it to explode at the time. Um, so who else uses TriConnex valves? Uh, I did a little Googling. Uh, oil refineries, water treatment plants, Reactors. They're, they're used for reactor cooling. You know, so, so who's going to update that one? Which one? Navy ships. Navy ships also use it. Thank you. The U.S. Navy, to a large extent, it's regularly treated with the factory Yeah, U.S. Navy. So, uh, yeah, so how are you going to update those to fix the security vulnerability? You, you must re reboot your reactor to complete this upgrade. This upgrade will take a while. Systems automation gets scary. Uh, so, you know, the joke is the S in IoT stands for security. <laughs> so, you know, why, why, why do I like to pick on IoT and SCADA so much? Um, and there's so much fun to pick on. You can always find something to pick on them for. Uh, it's because they're made, it, it, they consist of multiple industries who traditionally did not make online devices. Um, so they don't have the years of security practices that, that other industries have developed. You know, we have a, people ignore them, but we have a pretty good understanding of secure software practices. However, if you don't come from a software background or a networking background, you don't even know these things are out there and can happen to you. Um, 
So there's years of best practices that are completely unknown. It's a rando selection of hardware. Who knows what's in these things? And so everything in this works against them having a secure platform. So we keep getting these control and IoT systems that either you know, were designed by people who never thought about the internet or explicitly said, never connect this to the internet, and then someone did anyway, because why wouldn't you? Um, so I mean, you know, we're talking about these you know, crappy little devices. You know, what's really in them anyway? It's a, it's a PC or, or small. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's a microcontroller or a microprocessor, uh, some sort of network interface or radio, some sort of network stack, it's going to talk TCP or something, and it's some sort of operating system. It's either an RTOS real-time embedded system or it's, you know, just, it's just Linux. You know, if it's a microcontroller, there's tons of them out there. There's, there's thousands to pick from. There's lots of them from TI, Microchip, other companies that have built-in networking stacks and built-in, you know, storage and control systems. So you just, you know, you don't even have to understand the internet or that. You know, maybe someone might send you bad data. You just go, oh, I'll just connect this, and it gives me TCP, and I read that byte, and I open the valve. Um, usually they have very little RAM, and they're uh, usually not that complex of a chip. As you move into consumer devices, there's a thing called the, uh, the ESP. There's a couple different models, and it's, uh, it's $2 on eBay in single quantity and tens of cents in bulk. It's a processor. Uh, it's got all the interchip networking. It's got a full Wi-Fi stack. It can be an access point. It can send Wi-Fi packets. It can be a client to a network. Basically, anything you buy that connects to Wi-Fi and controls a light bulb is going to have one of these things in it. Um, or it's just straight up Linux. They just took a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone. Uh, BeagleBone makes industrial versions of their hardware designed to be embedded in control systems. And it's just running Linux. So it's just, you know, it's straight up Linux, it's Debian, or, or one of the other variants just shoved on your corporate network controlling things. So, you know, messing with IoT and SCADA is kind of like uh, time travel. So you get, you, get, you, get, you get to have a time machine and go back, but it's, uh, you know, you get to go back to the, 1980, to the 1980s and 1990s security model, but it's not hippie friendly. You get to go back with all your modern weapons and all the modern attack methods we have and all of the uh, all of the tools that we have now for disassembling code and attacking things and, uh, and breaking into it. So it, it, it's the naive approach towards network security from the 80s and 90s, but now we're, we're, we've got all, all the stuff we've developed and learned in the last 20 years. Um, so the problem is we don't learn. We have serious problems as an industry retaining knowledge. Um, we have even more problem explaining those things we've learned well to other groups. Um, so every time someone you know, every time a company decides, oh, I'm going to write a TCP stack from scratch. Don't do that. I'm going to write this network protocol from scratch. You're going to make the same mistakes that everyone has made for the last 20 years and have finally fixed maybe in an implementation you could have used. You know, so all of this stuff happens for a reason. Um, so, you know, what does a car manufacturer, or you know, does a car manufacturer know about hardening networks? What did we say? If the question's in the headline, the answer is no. Um, you know, do, do valve manufacturers know about advanced hardware attack techniques that would let someone extract their code and look for vulnerabilities? Um, if your company's decision is, I'll just shove a Raspberry Pi in there, are they going to know that it even needs kernel updates, and how are they going to get them to you if it does? They're not. Um, I mean, we've gotten pretty good at mitigating things. We're a hell of a lot better than we were. It sounds bad, it is bad, but it's better than it was. Um, operating systems get regular security fixes. We have Patch Tuesday. We have, we have uh, advanced techniques in the kernel and at the hardware level for preventing exploits from triggering even if they find a bug in the software. Things based on simpler chips don't have any of these protections. Things based on microcontrollers have none of these protections. So, you know, one of the, the simplest attacks is buffer overflow. It's basically, if, if you're not a programmer, if you have room for five bytes and you shove ten in there, those ten are going to go somewhere. And where they're going to go is most likely going to cause interesting problems. And one of the interesting problems you can cause is to then have it run code in those other bytes that you shoved in there. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's one of the most straightforward attacks out there, and it's been, it's been around for, for quite a while. Uh, and it's still effective, and it still gets you arbitrary code running on a system. So, 
we defeat this now. There's a thing called uh, address space lookup randomization, where basically uh, the the kernel and you know Windows does it, OS X does it, Linux does it, randomizes where it loads libraries. So you can't say go run this code in this library at this memory location because you don't know what that location is going to be because things are you know randomly shuffled around. The system doesn't care. It's all virtual memory mapped through dynamic locations, and it all works you know transparently. But it keeps it keeps the whole class of exploits from working trivially. Um, there's another thing called a non-executable uh, pages. So when you have a chunk of RAM uh, on, on Intel processors and others, you can say, this, this is code. I loaded this from a program on disk. It's going to, you're going to run code out of this piece of RAM. Or you can say, this is just data. I've allocated this, images go here and whatnot. So if someone finds a bug in your image parser and overwrites where you put your image in the buffer and tries to run code, the processor goes, that's a data page. You can't run code from there, and your exploit doesn't work. You know, again, there's still a bug in the software, but now we've, we've mitigated the effect of it, making it significantly harder, if not impossible in some cases, to, to get your code to run, even if you find the bug that would normally have let you do it. We don't have those on microcontrollers. So anything running on a little you know, RTOS embedded system isn't going to know virtual memory. It isn't going to know, you know code versus data. It isn't going to know address space randomization. It may not, might not even really have an operating system to do that with. If you don't have an MMU on the chip, you can't do virtual memory mapping, so you can't segregate uh, privileged and non-privileged memory. So you can't, for example, have a user model where this code doesn't have the ability to write memory to the kernel. It doesn't exist. It's all one flat memory model. So if you find an overflow on a microcontroller, it's almost certainly going to mean full execution because it lacks any of the hardware protections to mitigate that in the least. Um, so, you know, we said before the, the biggest risk comes from known vulnerabilities. So, you know, it's out there. People can look at the patches. They can figure out how the exploit works. So, do you have any Wi-Fi controlled light switches in your house? Maybe. Or, or, or they're, they're equivalent. Have you ever gotten an operating system update for your light bulb? How, how would you even update the firmware on a light bulb? But it's you know, it could be running an exploitable thing that would let someone, you know, monitor your home network or if, you know, your employees bring in their own lamps at work. I know people who do that. And now all of a sudden there's a Wi-Fi device that's able to see your corporate network that's unpatchable. Um, part of this is because upgrading microcontroller-based devices is really hard to do. You can't just, you know, hold down shift or hit F8 and boot into safe mode if it goes wrong and fix it. If it goes wrong, it's going to be a brick, and then they're going to, you're going to have an angry customer calling someone. Um, assuming whoever branded it and sold it is even the company that made it, because so many of these things are bulk produced with no label, branded as 10 different companies and sold on Amazon. Uh, none of the people selling it have access to the original manufacturing of the software, and they don't give a crap about supporting it anymore. Uh, a lot of these things, there isn't even a way to flash it without programmer hardware, where you take apart the thing and plug into it. So it's never going to see an update but it's still out there on Wi-Fi interacting with the world. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, you know, the great thing about attacking hardware is you can take hardware apart and mess with it. Uh, it is really, really, really hard to secure something when someone can rip it into pieces, solder onto it, and do whatever the hell they want. Um, and the great thing about mass-produced hardware is that it's all the same. So if I buy one and figure out how to mess with it, and it's the same as the one you have in your office, I don't have to be in your office to figure out how to break into you. Um, so part of the way to defeat this, uh, there's uh, security enclaves. So uh, some hardware has enhanced security options. Um, similar to a TPM in your laptop, uh, ARM calls it the TEE, or Trusted Execution Environment. Uh, uh, Apple calls it the Secure Enclave. Uh, Intel calls it SGX, where it's a, either a separate chip or a separate part of the processor running in a different privilege mode that lets you run secure code that normal code can't interact with. Um, but, you know, it sounds expensive, and it is. It doesn't necessarily show up on cheap microcontrollers that they're bulk producing and putting in air conditioners and light bulbs. Uh, typically, you only find something like that on, on a phone. 
Um, so embedded devices are uh, most likely a good external attack surface because they might also present an unencrypted configuration network. You know, how many people have set up a home automation thing where it's like, oh, well, connect to this open Wi-Fi and then put your Wi-Fi password into it, that kind of thing. Uh, they might activate uh, UPnP, uh, Universal Plug and Play, and tell your firewall, port forward this port from the internet directly to me and bypass the firewall. Uh, so now we have uh, these insecure, unupdatable systems talking to the outside world and your internal network. That, that, that couldn't be a problem. Doesn't sound like a recipe for disaster at all. Even if they don't talk to the outside world, now they're inside your network. So if someone gets you know, access to a laptop and can talk to this thing, now they have another place to attack or another thing to control. Uh, so mixing you know, your office and your control networks is a really bad idea. Don't ever you know, have the same thing that controls the dump valve on your oil tank be on the same network as you know, Bob's laptop looking at web pages. Um, and you know, some of these attacks can, go, can have you know, effectively infinite time. You know, as much time as someone wants to spend, if they can go buy the same control valve that you use, take it apart, solder into it, dump the firmware, power glitch it, attack, all, attack the hardware in all these different ways, they can spend two months on it and you'll never know because they just happen to know it's the same one you use. They've never been to your office. They've never, you know, they're not hanging out in your parking lot. They're not aiming an antenna at your building. They're working on their own thing until they find a way in. Then they're going to come and be your problem. Um, so when you control the hardware, there's a ton of different things you can do to it. Even if, even if the company's trying to prevent you from attacking the hardware, and most of them don't bother. So, you know, one of the easy ways to attack, attack hardware is, uh, is timing attacks, so timing side channel attacks. Uh, if you can measure uh, exactly when instructions ep execute on the processor, then you can start uh, deriving uh, information about how it's behaving. So, you know, for example, let's look at, you know, pseudocode for comparing a password. Hypothetical. I happen to know this exact method is used in thousands of microcontrollers, though. You know, so, say we had some basic, basic code. You know, for each character in your password, if the, password, if the character the user gave is not the same as the character in the saved password, return. Seems right, right? I mean, if, if they type something that isn't what the password is, kick out. But so we're talking about timing attacks. So who's who's already spotted the problem? You can attack it sequentially. You can attack it sequentially. Yeah. So this lets you know if you can if you know how long it takes the processor to run an instruction and that's measurable with fairly cheap hardware now, you know how much of the password you got right. If the password is 12345 and I gave it a b c d e, then it fails immediately. I know the first character is not right. But if I gave it one A, B, C, D, E, then the first character will match and the second one will instantly fail. And now I know I've got the first character right. So you can do movie hacking where it spins through the password and each character locks in in sequence. <laughs> uh, the same thing can happen with crypto systems where if you can watch how long it's spending deriving the keys, then you can guess things about the crypto model that it's building. It also happens with certif certificate validation. So all of these things are things that the public SSL libraries have had to spend years developing, you know, ensuring that every single compare is constant time. It has to take the same amount of time if the password's good or if the password's bad, or if the key is good or the key is bad or the hashes match or the hashes don't. If you go write your own library for some of this stuff and you don't know that, now all of a sudden you've got a very attackable timing channel in there. You can also watch how much power the system's using. So different CPU instructions take different amounts of power, and different code blocks take different amounts of power. Uh, it's, uh, so you can actually do power analysis and extract crypto keys based on how much processing power the CPU is using while it's computing crypto. Um, this can even be used against more complex systems than microcontrollers. Uh, there's been research with modified uh, USB power bricks that watch the power uses of an Android phone and figure out SSL keys from it just by watching how much power it uses while it's charging if someone's browsing the web. So, you know, do you still want to plug into random chargers while you're out there? Uh, so this is from a, a research paper from China where they're actually able to monitor the number of characters typed based on the power draws that calculated the, the, the uh, finger, the, the password length. 
So this is just coming off the USB power bus, not even taking the phone apart. Um, you can also do interesting things if you glitch the power going to these chips. And you know, so it's another, it's an attack that you wouldn't be able to do if you're sitting in an office and people were looking at you, but if you have the same thing at home, you can sit there and glitch this thing all day long until you get the result that you want. Uh, because processors, it, processors expect a uh, consistent, stable, clean power feed. They have all these capacitors and electronics on the board to ensure that you're, they're, they're getting a good power feed. And if you give it a crappy one, it's not going to be happy. So you combine those with timing attacks. So if you know when the processor is about to do something interesting and you can mess with its power at the same time, things can happen. So for example, you know, many microcontrollers in consumer devices and whatnot have a, a bit set where they say you can, you can flash new firmware on, but you can't read the firmware that's in it if this bit is set. Uh, so what happens? It boots up, uh, you, you connect your debugger to it, and you say, send me your firmware. And the processor goes, all right, I'm going to go read this bit. Is this bit set? If it is, set the CPU register and you know, return. And if, you know, if, if this register is set, don't allow the firmware to, to be downloaded. Uh, setting registers, uh, so when flipping the, the flip-flops in silicon, are, takes power to do. You're causing a, a, a state change, so it, it's drawing additional power to set that register to true. What happens if you drop the voltage to 25% at the exact microsecond that the processor is trying to set that register? It doesn't set it. So it doesn't have the power to trip the switch. So the register remains at zero, and now you can read the firmware. Um, to prove how practical this was, uh, Travis Goodspeed made a device called the BadFet, which is a public piece of hardware. Uh, that whole thing costs about 20 bucks to build, and it measures timing cycles, and you say, you know, issue this request, and 14 milliseconds afterwards, drop the voltage by this much. So it's, it's designed explicitly to power glitch embedded controllers and dump firmware out of IoT devices. Uh, now, scale this up to modern processors, not just microcontrollers. So, modern processors have power control, which means you can software control the amount of power going to the chip. It's used for, you know, power management, heat management. Uh, the battery system on phones ties into that so it can throttle down the CPU and prevent the system from overheating. Um, so, we also mentioned, you know, trusted execution environments. So, some of them, instead of being a separate chip, are a separate mode of the processor. So, the same chip is running normal code and secure code and the same chip is controlled by the same power management system. So people discovered that if you use the power management system and undervolt the processor while it's doing things like computing crypto, uh, you can actually glitch it so that you can, can uh, convert it from quadrillions or more of possible keys to thousands of known keys that you can then manually compare. So just by controlling the power to the processor, you can glitch the crypto algorithms and make them guessable. Um, you can also corrupt the prime factorization and generate collisions where it thinks it has checked a signed binary, but it hasn't because you've created collisions and now you've got, you know, thousands of vulnerabilities that you can, or thousands of matching hashes. Uh, so, you know, so the RMTE is, is vulnerable to this. Uh, it was shown with uh, several research papers recently. Uh, and it would allow extraction of the key data that's normally only stored in the enclave that can't be read by normal processes now can suddenly be read out using power glitching attacks. Uh, you can also run your own code in the trusted environment by glitching the signatures so that it thinks it's signed code when it isn't. There's no fix. I mean, it, it's in hardware. You're, you're, you're not going to patch it. Uh, Intel has recently had vulnerabilities in their SGX enclave as well. Uh, other physical attacks. Uh, Rowhammer. Uh, this came out about two years ago, and it's a physical layer attack at how RAM works at the electrical level. Uh, pretty much by flipping one set of RAM back and forth between 0 and 1 really quickly, you can make other parts of RAM not have enough voltage to correctly, correctly maintain their state. So if you happen to have a page of RAM next to the kernel, and start flipping it back and forth, all of a sudden you can flip your user ID to zero. Um, so the operating system's been trying to mitigate this. Uh, you know, so now Windows and Linux and OS X won't put user space memory right next to kernel space memory if they can avoid it, which means they have to know the physical mapping of RAM. Um, that's, that's pretty chanky. I mean, <laughs> keep things apart and hope they don't, they don't intersect each other. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's been proven to work via JavaScript in Chrome on Android. Uh, 
it can work via OpenGL on graphics cards. Uh, the shader languages on graphics cards can affect memory, so they can use uh, DMA memory sharing to affect pages in system memory and flip them back and forth outside of the operating system's control. Uh, someone recently discovered that if you have a 10 gigabit Ethernet card that does uh, PCI memory sharing and send it properly formed packets, when it copies it into system RAM, you can flip the pages back and forth fast enough to cause row hammer uh, like effects. Um, you know, going further down the hole, you know, I'm sure everyone now has heard about Spectre Meltdown and all their friends. Um, you know, it can go on forever about them, but it basically comes down to, you know, a modern processor is trying to do a whole lot of things at the same time. They like to guess what they're going to do next so that they don't ever stop and wait. And you can get them to leak information, because if they guess wrong and have to rewind time, they don't rewind it completely correctly and all sorts of things like that. So Intel is struggling to fix this. All the operating system vendors are struggling to fix this. But it impacts every processor out there that uses speculative execution. So things like mainframes or even, you know, embedded ARM devices that use it. So is, is your IoT vendor or your, your valve control vendor going to give you a fix for this type of thing? They're not. They're not. They're just not. Um, so, you know, once you, once you have access to one of these devices, however you got it, you know, how do you, you know, get to the rest of the network from that? Uh, you can, you know, just pivot through that and use it to attack other systems on the network. So, you know, once, once you get in with one part, <laughs> um, so, you know, just to prove this isn't, this isn't tinfoil hatty. Um, a casino in Vegas, and they're not saying which one, recently lost its whole customer database of their high rollers group. So everyone who spends a million dollars or more at this casino, everything the casino knows about them got lost. Um, it was compromised because they had a fish tank in their lobby with an internet connected thermometer to make sure the fish were happy. They owned the thermometer and pivoted it into the corporate network and stole the data out of the registration desks systems via the thermometer. Now it is important to note here, you know, we said before, segregate your networks. Don't mix your control network and your office network. The casinos are really good about that because of gaming laws and because they handle millions and millions of dollars. It did not get into the gaming network. So this did not impact any of the casino machines. It didn't cause direct monetary loss because the networks are separated and you can't go from the office network to the other network. However, you can go from the thermometer to the office network to Bob's PC running Outlook and grab the Excel file of all the important people that they want to treat nice. Um, you know, many of these sensors either can't use encryption, don't use encryption, or offer an unencrypted side channel for configuration. Um, they might make unencrypted connections like HTTP instead of SSL to servers to push their data going out. Um, and then you could use that to exploit vulnerabilities in those servers. Um, universal plug and play is used to map external ports to internal devices. So the, uh, the Mirai botnet was made out of security cameras, and they were all on, almost all on internal networks, not, not directly connected to the internet. But they open a UPnP port so that you can view your security camera from elsewhere. So all of a sudden, all these firewalls just had ports punched right through them into this vulnerable device on the inside with a default credential. Uh, so, you know, let's say you've got one of these devices handy. What can you do to it? Well, the easy thing you can do, you can pull the firmware, uh, you can pull the firmware out of it, or you can download the firmware update for it from the internet and dump it. Just run the strings command against it in Linux and just see, you know, do URLs pop up out of there? Do usernames pop up out of there that are just unencrypted plain text URLs? Now you have other things to talk to to try to compromise. Um, many firmware images uh, are just full file systems if it's a Linux-based system. So if it's running OpenWord or something like that internally, it's just a full file system. Uh, the utility binwalk is your friend here. So for example, here's a couple of firmwares from routers where it is, you know, okay, well, squashfs file system, uh, there's the kernel, there's the file system again. So you can just pull those right out, mount them, and browse the file system as if it were just, you know, a Linux disk. Uh, here's a random security camera. I just, you know, security camera firmware update Google download binwalk on the file. So here's you know, here's, here's various binaries out of it. 
with file systems. Uh, here's SquashFS file system. There's the bootloader. Uh, the kernel's in there somewhere. And you can just pull these right out and start looking through the file system for you know, hard-coded URLs that aren't encrypted, uh, anything else it might be talking to. Maybe it has URLs to places that you never put into it. So where, what's it talking to them about? Um, you know, a little more difficult, if you can open the device, you can tap the communications buses between the chips. Uh, so you can just, you know, put little clips on the pins between the radio and the microcontroller and see what it's saying. So, you know, the common protocols for that are things like I2C or, or SPI. Um, a lot of low power sensor devices don't do the crypto on the radio, or don't do the crypto on the CPU, it's on the radio. So the CPU boots and sends the radio the encryption key in plain text for the network. So you can just, you know, sniff this and see what the the last encryption key it used was. So I mean, you can just tap onto chips. And I won't say it's, it's, it's not dead simple, but I'd say that all of these you could do for under $200 if you were motivated to do so. I mean, so for example, here's, you know, a, here's a chip that didn't have, you know, certain control lines exposed, and you can just solder onto it, pull them out, and then talk to the chip with a debugger directly. Um, there's dirt cheap logic analyzers out there. This is what I was saying about you know bringing back modern tools to the 80s. You know in the 80s these things were $50,000 and a tenth as capable. Um, you can now get these for between 50 and 200 dollars. Uh, that can do eight or 16 channels at you know a megahertz sampling rate, reading all this data, and then automatically decode the protocol between the chips so you can read it. So, like there there's open source. Uh, logic analyzer software, so it's monitoring all the different buses on a chip here and giving the logic output of all of them. So if you're going to try to attack one of these things physically, you know, for 80 bucks in open source software, there you go. Uh, the expert insane pro level is a thing called the focused ion beam, which allows you to do things like drill into the silicon cells of the processor and lay new platinum traces. So you can actually short out parts of the chip at the physical layer. Um, this was done by uh, Chris Farnofsky to attack uh, TPM modules, where he would raise, he would drill into the instruction bus, pull out one of the uh, lines that make up the instructions going to the, to the decoder, and then he could scramble the instruction that would prevent him from reading data off of the chip. Um, so, you know, is someone with a fib a realistic threat? Hell no. Not to almost anybody in here. It's very interesting. However, if you're a defense contractor, again, your threat model is very different. Or if you make gaming systems. So this TPM in question was the one in the Xbox 360 and controlled the keys used to authorize if a game could run or not. Now, if you're Microsoft, maybe you do care about this because maybe someone out there with one of these things is going to extract your keys so they can either clone your hardware or they can pirate games. Now all of a sudden the profit balance has changed for whether or not it makes sense to attack the system. I mean, would you... Would you go hire someone with these skills for $150,000 to attack a light bulb? Probably not, unless you're attacking a government contractor you know is running that in their office. But if you could then pirate games for the 360 and sell that exploit to the pirates for millions of dollars, yeah, all of a sudden that profit balance makes sense to do. So, you know, what are the risks of failure? If it's a one-of-a-kind system, you know, if, you, if, if you're an attacker and you can only get your hands on this thing once, you're not going to take it apart, tap the buses, and hope you don't fry the system. However, you know, so if it's things like an evidentiary device, so for example, the, the FBI iPhone stuff that came up a couple years ago, they may have had other techniques for taking that apart and getting data out of it, but if they got it wrong, they'd lose the evidence. So they're not going to do it against that kind of thing. However, if it's a device that can be uh, swapped out, uh, you know, if you can buy them in bulk online or at a store, you know, even if it's expensive, you know, even if the console is $400 or a phone is $1,000, so what if you kill 10 of them, if you're going to sell this thing for $900,000 when you're done? Um, so the other, you know, the other question on, this, on all the hardware is, uh, where does your hardware come from? And uh, do you use you know, pre-installed systems on the hardware you're running in your offices? Um, do your hardware vendors protect their own supply chains? You, know, you get this appliance from someone, and it's you know, running a web UI, and it filters your email set. Did they get owned? Did they just ship you a box that's already backdoored that you're about to put on your network and feed all your email to? Hope not. 
Uh, so Android phones, again, I like to pick on Android. Uh, RottenSys is a malware that they found uh, this, uh, this spring on over 5 million Android phones pre-installed from the factory, including phones certified by Google with the Play Store pre-installed, because this got put on at manufacture time. Uh, it includes uh, Oppo, Honor, ZTE, Arcos. Uh, there's dozens of manufacturers. Uh, hundreds of, of models of phones are all vulnerable to this. They're mostly not sold in the U.S., but uh, they are still available. They're on Amazon. They're prevalent. Uh, this is mainly an ad network that is just making tons of money by shoving ads at the screen from a system process that can't be uninstalled because it was put in at the factory level. Um, do you have appliances in your company that are controlled by tablets or similar type uh, Android systems? You know, where did their system images come from? Um, ZTE and Huawei are good examples now because they've been recently been banned from sales to the U.S. government. Um, and the U.S. government has banned any company doing business with the U.S. government from selling ZTE and Huawei hardware uh, because the U.S. government has declared them to be an extension of the intelligence branch. Uh, and they are preventing them from selling 5G hardware for the new uh, cellular backbones. You know, is it legit? Who knows? Attribution's really hard, but it's happening. Um, you know, if you're buying hardware, are you getting counterfeit hardware? You know, counterfeit stuff, you know, at best, they probably won't work quite spec. Um, maybe they don't work at all. It could just be a brick, and now you're going, eh, eh, throw it out, buy another $10 thing from Amazon. Um, but at worst, they work, and they have hidden features. So, you know, crypto counts on high-quality random data. It is pretty easy to compromise random number generators and processors and such in ways that they, they appear to work, but generate far less random data, which allows you to then derive any key generated by that system. You know, what other hardware components are in the supply chain? You know, hard drives, uh, hard drives, processors, RAM, network cards, all of these things can have, you know, hidden problems. Um, so there's also a thing called ghost shifts. So I used to work designing secure Android phones. And at some point, after I left the company, I started hearing, oh, there's a whole bunch of cheap models of the phone up. Like, that's interesting. Turns out, the manufacturer just ran another shift and made another 10 or 20,000 of these phones, but without our firmware on. So they stripped all the security firmware off of it, put a generic firmware on, put the same wallpaper on it, and sold them. And then people tried to upgrade them, and all of a sudden it didn't work because it didn't have any of the hardware keys installed. It's like, oh, that's not good. Um, so, you know, the problem with the ghost shift hardware is it looks like, it looks exactly like legit hardware, because it is. It just was made later under the table, and who knows what software is running on it. And you know, so from, from the software level, how many libraries do you, does your software use? You know, how big is your server, your, your software stack between you know Apache, Nginx, SQL, PHP, JavaScript libraries, Node? How many sub libraries is Node pulling in and NPM pulling in, running stuff? You know, where do the, where do all those libraries come from? How do you update them? Are you using Docker? Where do your Docker images come from? Docker lets anyone upload an image to Docker. And if you're not paying attention, you'll just go, oh, well, OK, this is already pre-installed. Pull that Docker image down, throw my login info into it, pre-configure that, and the server's up and running, and it's great. Uh, Docker just pulled 10 or 15 images down that had been downloaded over a million times that were pre-installed with crypto miner software. So everyone who pulled them down just burned all their CPUs mining crypto coins for these guys. I guarantee you there's more than 10 or 15 of these that they caught. So what else is pre-configured in all those other ones? You know, this was crypto coin stuff. It could have easily have been, you know, memory scrapers that were pulling uh, login details out of the processes running in Docker. So, you know, how far down the rabbit hole are we going to go with, with these things being vulnerable? Solution. I can't see the problem. So, I mean, it's all pointless, right? We, we, we failed. It's all going to get owned. In an absolutist sense, I mean, yeah. Um, if you're interesting enough to burn O'Day on because you do government security or military or, or you're a large bank, you're, you're going to lose. Uh, is it even worth trying? It's fine. <laughs> Everything's fine. So, you know, as Sun Tzu said, never let the enemy, never let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Or as Abraham Lincoln said, don't trust every quote you read on the internet. Um, 
So you know, the, the, the goal is to come up with effective, effective things you can spend your effort on, things that will actually make a difference. Um, you know, every barrier helps. Uh, every trivial problem you solve raises the cost of attacking it. So if you can weed out, you know, the bottom 90%, then you might not even get hit by the top 10%. And if you do, you've at least still got the resources to, resources to deal with it because you're not spending all your time re-imaging everybody's system for every piece of malware that comes along that gets them. Um, so, you know, things, you, things to consider. You know, in your company, do you already have a security group? Um, if you do, you know, and you're interested in security stuff, try to work with them, um, especially if you... You know, if, you, if you're not even aware that you have a security group and you're in networking or servers or something, then you should be talking with them and they should be caring about how systems are being maintained. Um, typically, the uh, security group would be responsible for the public responses. So if you're, a, if you're a hardware or software vendor, you would have a group that would, you know, guarantee responses to vulnerabilities within certain time frames, uh, public disclosure, you know, security notes and updates. Um, how far back in your version history you have to apply the security update for people who can't upgrade to the latest version. Um, if you have a CISO, they should be in the security group. If they're not, something is very wrong with your company. Um, and often, you know, this group would be involved with the developers, it would be involved with legal, it would be servers, networking, Every, everybody would be involved. Um, if the management and C-levels are, aren't on board for this, it is not going to go well. So if you're looking to establish a security group at your company, I would recommend, you know, getting your CTO on board first. Um, you know, you don't want to interfere with people's processes. You don't want to be the guys that everyone tries to have to work around because you always say no. And you don't want to say, no, shut it all down. We can't ship this week. That's, that's the disaster case. But if you ever need to, you do need the ability to say, you know, you're about to ship something that's known vulnerable. It's going to get hit by this worm. You need to stop and fix it, even if it's going to cost us a week in our schedule. Or, you know, just rubber stamp everything. Um, you know, if you're, if you're making a product, if it's, if it's software or hardware, um, you, you, you should be defining your, your handling process. You should have a group of people that respond to reported security, security incidents. Um, you should have, you know, policies to determine how severe vulnerability is. You know, some of them might be annoyances, some of them might be, you know, okay, this is bad, but someone has to already be on the admin login page. Someone already has to be logged in as an admin to cause this to happen. That's bad. You have to fix it. Because sooner or later, someone's going to get owned and already be logged in, and someone's going to find a way to do this to you. But it's not a someone in the parking lot can own our system and take all our data level book. Um, but you do need you know, the oh shit handle for you know, hit the button, stop development, fix this immediately because oh no. Um, you know, you need to have a system in place for doing hotfix releases. So you need to work with your product team about, you know, we've got this super critical, someone in the parking lot can own everything and, and pull all the data out of our system. You know, how do we get a fix out there now outside of our release cycle? So it, it's good to have these things in place before it becomes a problem. Um, how will you notify customers that there is a security update they need to apply? I mean, all, all these things are, are things that, that, that feed into getting the update out there and, and in, 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 in place so that you don't get smacked in the face. If you are, you know, a systems administrator, you know, how do you apply updates? Do you have a process for knowing that there are new security updates for every system that you have? How do you audit that all the updates have actually been applied to all these systems when they might be managed by multiple groups inside your company? Um, you know, do you have a way of knowing exactly what version is already on all your servers? Uh, there's a bunch of, of sensor software out there that can monitor what systems are, what, what versions are on systems and whatnot. That can be used in very large companies. In smaller companies, you can just you know run queries against the servers regularly. Um, are you running containers like Docker? How do you update all the software in each of those containers? Do you have a process in place for that? Because you might have you know your system updated, but then you're running a vulnerable version of PHP in a Docker container and don't even know. Um, do you and can you force security updates for people who bring their own devices to work? Can you say you know, no, you can't bring that Windows machine that hasn't been updated in eight months onto the network? Um, you know, so the problem here is the customer will never congratulate you on having a good security policy. No one is ever going to go, oh man, we picked you because you had a privacy document and a security policy published on your website. No, but when you screw up, they are going to rip you apart. Uh, so try to target, you know, effective solutions. Solving everything isn't going to be possible. Getting everyone in your company to do secure things isn't going to be possible. But you can try to be effective with the energy and effort and time that you have. Uh, 
So, you know, useful questions from the security group would be, you know, was it discovered outside the company? Is this a publicly known vulnerability? Was this reported to us? Like, is this out there in the wild? Could this be sold as an exploit, or could this be, uh, you know, posted on a website already? Or is it, you know, is it a vulnerability in PHP that is now public and patched, and it's known out in the world, and people can now use it against us, we need to get updated as soon as possible? Uh, does it require authentication to trigger? I mean, can they hit it from the parking lot? With no, no logins at all, or do they have to be a user inside your company? You know, neither is good, but one is definitely a different level of urgency than the other. You know, what's the impact? Can they cause the system to reboot? Well, that's really not good, but if all that causes is a reboot, then maybe it's not as urgent as it could be. Um, and, you know, who are the most vulnerable users? Not so useful questions would be, you know, how hard is it to write an exploit for this? Well, it's real hard until someone clever does it and then everyone has it. It's not, it's not a good model. How likely is it? Well, it's never going to happen until someone decides to do it, and now, as soon as it gets published, everyone will try it against you. Is it really a security problem? Uh, there's a rich history of, well, you can't turn that into an exploit. Watch me. Um, and I mean, you don't need to be an expert in security to care about security stuff. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to go take apart IoT devices and tap the hardware to know that it can be done and know that maybe you should be aware of where these things get put in your corporate network. Um, it's kind of, you know, just kind of encourage everyone to take part and keep an eye out for weirdness going on on the network. Like if someone's like, man, my system keeps showing ads and I didn't, I don't know why. Like, well, maybe you're infected with something. Just kind of, kind of be aware of it. Because um, also, you know, the vulnerable users aren't the, necessarily the ones with exciting job titles. So anyone in HR is a huge target now for scams. Uh, anyone in payroll and billing, anyone involved in finance and stock disclosure stuff are all major targets now for phishing attacks to try to get insider info or to initiate bank transfers from your company. Uh, CFOs are obviously major targets. Uh, if you're involved in security in your company, protect your C-levels. They are business people. They may or may not know crap about what they're doing. They may just click on random emails. Watch out. Um, you know, security is hard. Constant vigilance is hard. And, you know, it's fun to say, well, you were dumb and shouldn't have gone to that page at work. But, you know, do you want to spend 10 minutes trying to help someone understand why they shouldn't, or do you want to spend all day rebuilding their system after their, you know, desktop gets owned and you have to re-image it? Uh, so, the, you know, if the security group is known for just stalling projects and always saying no, people are going to find ways to not involve the security group in things. Um, if the solutions make it impossible to work, people are going to find a way to bypass them. Um, so, you know, this is effective but it's not particularly usable. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we can't solve everything, uh, so, but, you know, what can we do about it? Uh, you know, know what your systems are running, know what traffic is normal, firewall everything if you're a system. You know, prevent your system from talking out, prevent people from talking in on anything other than what you expect. Uh, apply access controls, apply SE Linux, use multi-factor login. Um, if you are uh, on a network, you know, difficult to maintain without a type link to the server group, but you can, uh, you know, again, firewall, prevent access between them, segregate types of networks in your, in your company. Um, as a home user, uh, use a reputable router. You know, the big, big name brands sure have problems, but they're at least going to get an update when the $5 one probably won't. Uh, if you're a Linux nerd already, OpenWirt, Lead, uh, DDWirt, they all offer, you know, frequent updates, and you can apply them to a lot of home routers if you're comfortable with the idea of flashing your own router and running a different operating system on it. Very good gear is cheap. Uh, Ubiquity Edge Router is practically enterprise stuff, and it's 200 bucks or less. It's got command line interface. It's got web interface. It's almost like a Cisco switch from 10 years ago. It's pretty great. Um, just even on your own, use two-factor authentication. Use two-factor authentication. Uh, Encrypt, do full disk encryption. Uh, be suspicious of weirdo emails. Follow up with alternate methods if you think you've gotten a weird email. Does the email seem really weird and someone's asking you for a password? Call them. Just call them or text them. Just, you know, reach out to them some way other than email and make sure they're actually doing that. Because uh, there is a horrific new scam going on right now, especially in Australia, where they compromised the Office 365 accounts of real estate agents, man in the middle it, and changed the account numbers for the house down payment wire transfer. Yeah. 
and then the bank isn't liable because you signed an agreement with the bank that said, well, I told you this number, and the bank's like, okay, I sent it to that number. Real estate agent isn't liable, they didn't send that email, but now you're out your life savings as your down payment. Um, you know, this is one of those horrible ones where you, there's a lot of, you know, haha, hacking's kind of fun, let's talk about, you know, nation state hacking is like, well, shit, this guy just lost $180,000 he's never going to see again. That's, it's really bad. Um, you can do two-factor auth for SSH. It's called Krypton. I recommend Googling it. I'm, I'm hurrying up a little because we're running towards the end of the time slot. Time's over. Next it is. Yeah, Shit. Okay. Um, I will chat with people outside about this a bit, I guess, and I'm going to go really fast. Uh, you, know, you can do all sorts of defensive programming. Uh, look out for field lengths. Look out for signed data values. Um, privilege separate so you don't capture as you don't decode his root when you capture his root. Um, and here's some more material for anybody who would like to Google some things. Um, if you want to take a photo of that or it'll be in the slides later. But these are all great sites. Uh, the Risky Biz podcast has tons of good info. Uh, James Mickens, like I said, Google him. Everything he's written is a gem. Um, thank you.